This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 141 of Healthy Critters Radio on the Horse Radio Network. Healthy Critters Radio is brought to you by Biostar US. Find them online at biostarus.com. On today's show, we sit down with dog trainer Karen Quinlan to discuss separation anxiety in dogs. The sport of the show is barn hunt. In Tigapedia, we answer a question about diet change for hind gut ulcer horses. And in Coffee Clutch, Jennifer shares her best road trip stories. Listen in. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tigger. Hello, I'm Coach Jen. And Patty is traveling today, so she can't be with us. But Aww. she's with us in spirit. Aww. <laughs> yes. Hopefully she's going somewhere fun. Well, she's actually flying from Virginia back to Texas. So. Well, that um, usually means she's going to go do some fun horse things. So that would make it good. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, that's interesting that Patty is traveling. I just got done with some serious traveling that we're going <laughs> to yes. chat about a little later in the show. Um, so I had a question for Tigger because I was in charge of chit chat today. Therefore, Tigger gets quizzed. <laughs> when we left on our epic road trip of yes. 33 days, Jesus, we had many, 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 many spreadsheets. It was planned and planned and planned. When you travel, in particular for extended periods of time, are you more prone to doing a lot of planning or are you more the just wing it and see what happens sort? Both. Now that you can't have both. Yes, you can. If I'm traveling like I do to Wellington, I wing it. Well, that's because it's the same trip every year, basically. You go, you yes. Know, yeah. But if I'm going to, like, Alaska, it's planned. It's not in spreadsheets, but I know where I'm staying. I know how many days I, you know, I, I know I have a rental car. Um, but that's the, my only planning is where I'm staying and a, and a car. And, of course, <laughs> airplane. Airplane. <laughs> that's pretty much it. So you're a planner. Are you prone to the... Nothing going on interesting in my life next weekend. Let's take a quick trip to somewhere. I used to be, but with eight dogs, six horses, and a farm, it's not possible. <laughs> Just no more. So anybody out there who's uh, thinking about, if you're thinking about purchasing a farm, oh, I want to have my horse in my backyard. I want to have my own place instead of boarding. Uh, think about that before you do. If you're one of those people who likes to do spontaneous travel. Yeah. Being a farm owner is not really conducive to spontaneous travel. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. There you go. So whenever you had spontaneous travel in your mm -hmm. life, what were some of your go-tos? What were you prone to? You mean places? Yeah, places or things. Because Glenn and I, late in our life... We love spontaneous travel. It's not always been part of our life, but we love doing it when it, when we can. Um, we have a propensity to do spontaneous travel to do fill in the blank versus to go to a place. Like we would re don't want to go to Hawaii. We want to um, go climb a volcano. See the difference there. So I do. So wh where where do you fall on that scale? Well, when I was younger, it was it was definitely, you know, concerts and happenings and um, <laughs> weekends of frivolity <laughs> um, in my more senior years. Uh, since I'm kind of grounded by the farm, I think if I was to plan to take a weekend, a relatively spontaneous weekend... It would be to be, 
you know, either in the mountains or by the ocean and away from people. Ah, so from your point of view, what you want to go and do consists of being in that place physically and mentally where you are alone. Use my little air quotes. Yeah. To get away from the get get away from the rat race and yes. Let yes. your let your brain be quiet. We're going to be talking yeah. a little bit about that later in the show too. <laughs> yes, I, I I like disconnecting. I don't get to do it enough, and I'm not disciplined enough to make myself do it at home. Mm-hmm. But I I really do like not having a phone and internet, and I, I just. It's a little it's it's a little bit troubling the first couple of hours because you're like, what am I missing? And yeah. I get this email. And yeah. but then when that passes it, wow, I just feel so much more centered and I, f- I get more in touch with what's important. Yeah. So if we flip that conversation around a little bit for our animals, dogs, cats, horses, etc. Do you feel like particularly animals that are competition animals, show dogs, show horses, show cats. There is such a thing. Show gerbils. Uh, show, show gerbils. <laughs> Do you think that that type of disconnection where they're away from that lifestyle, because it's an intense lifestyle, can be beneficial? Do you think they need it? I don't know. Yes. Yeah? Yes. And what 100%. would it look like? Well, I think when you bring a horse back from a show, I mean, the, the horses always are glad to be home and they, you know, generally most people give the horse at least a day off after competing. And you can see that the horse in there mentally has just exhaled, Mm -hmm. you know, taken a breath Mm -hmm. there. Maybe they have more turnout time and just more time to rest and relax. And, and the same with the dogs. Um, I think, I, I think, beans need an off switch and 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 our our society and our culture is so plugged in now even even dogs in our home they're listening to you know the music that we play the tv's on the computer's going we're on the phone i mean there's a lot of technology going on in in a house mhm Interesting. So Thunder, the competition horse, has had a long, strenuous show season. But you hear this often in the horse world, that Thunder, the competition horse, does not enjoy turnout. He goes out and he gets turned out and he paces the fence and he runs and he fusses and he stomps at the gate until you bring him back in and put him in his stall. So it would be interesting to hear from people how they have solved the problem of what do you do with the horse that doesn't want turnout as his break? As well, his I think you have to isol- You have to identify why is he that way in turnout? Is it because he's by himself? Is he better if he had a little mini with him? Um, is he just so fit and athletic? that he'll turn himself inside out if he's loose? Um, is he? Is it anxiety that he's not back in his stall, sort of stall separation anxiety? Um, I think you have to find out why each individual horse yeah. doesn't like turnout because they're designed to be in turnout. God made them to be in turnout. Well, I see, in, in that respect, I disagree in that, Many, many breeds of horses has been bred for thousands of years to not thrive on turnout. And I think if particularly a competition horse who's never experienced it, they were brought in as a two or three year old and they've lived in a stall ever since. That is not something that's part of their life. And to suddenly expect them to enjoy it just because it works for us. I think there needs to be some kind of. And again, would, we'll talk I, about this I a little bit later in the show. You that, have to get you make um, you have to make steps towards that. You can't just turn them out and throw. Oh, I'll just put them out and put a mini with them. Well, that's probably not going to work. Maybe you should take them out into the paddock that they're not familiar with and hand walk them for twenty minutes three times a day. 
But I'm assuming they've already been in a paddock before that it's that See, they just. And- but it's it's not always that way. So many times we make that assumption, and there's so many people who get a horse who never has been. There are lots and lots of horses whose life is very, very narrowly defined, one that's never been at a stall, and it's 10 years old, and it's gone to horse shows and trail rides, one that is 15 years old and has never seen a horse trailer, one that is a six-year-old and hasn't seen a paddock in five and a half years. There's so many variables there that we have to, we, we shouldn't assume that they're going to like it. We should be prepared to take the baby steps so that they can enjoy that disconnect time. I, I think what you're highlighting is what we've done to them. Oh, oh, yeah, it's what we've done to him, but it's done. It's not a case of, well, we shouldn't have, therefore we're going to pretend it didn't happen. It I mean, I happen. would never <laughs> take a show horse and turn them out in a field and say, hey, enjoy your retirement. People do, though. You hear about it all the time. Lots of people do that They do, without realizing it because, again, well, they're meant to be turned out. It's a horse. It's designed to go out and eat grass and be free. But – be prepared to allow the horse to develop oh, yeah, the they, love they of that. Absolutely have to be conditioned. Yeah. You can't just throw them out. But I'm talking about turnout as here's your paddock. You go out in it every day. And now we're back from the show and you get to go out in it again. Yeah. Yeah. Because they generally, most show horses get maybe an hour of turnout, maybe two a day. Because we know that their health suffers when they're confined to a stall for 23 hours a day. And that's not a healthy thing. They either need to, when they're not ridden, they need to be out, you know, hand walking, hand grazing, turn out on the walker, moving. It's yeah. the moving part. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I need to do more of that too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> get me on a horse walker. There we go. Get me a, I need a hot walker. There we go. Well, sp- speaking of moving around. Why don't we get a hold of Hedwig and see where she's where moving? Where she's moving. <laughs> so now it's that time of the show, everybody's favorite, when we make a phone call to the Internet's only talking Pomeranian. That's right. She's a talking Pomeranian, and her name is Hedwig. Hello. Well, Hedwig, we we have an important question for you today. Ready? Uh, ready. You often speak about your siblings. You have quite a few now. Many. And you'll often hear human beings who have lots of siblings talk about how nice it is to have lots and lots of brothers and sisters because you're never alone. Do you enjoy having an extra large family of siblings now, or do you find yourself craving some alone time? You know, that is a very interesting question. I think what I would point to in my experience as a puppy mill dog is that dogs have been the only good thing in my life. So I am very happy to have a home with many nice dogs, and we like to pat around, you know, but we also divide up in little pairs. So I still spend the majority of my time with my sister, Christabel, and then Peas Blossom, Mustard Seed, and the Ridiculous Goblin tend to spend more time together, although lately Mustard Seed has been hanging with me and the bell, and Peas Blossom and the Goblin have been hanging out quite a bit. So, you know, we always have our little cliques and our friendships, and we can move around. So, I like to have a big family. You you like to have a big family. Do you feel like your human servant has a sufficiently large family to keep her company? Well, let's just be grateful there's only one of those, huh? Do you do you think your your I mean, human do you think your human servant would benefit from having additional humans around? Do you think is, is she's got plenty? Oh no, she's fine. She does better more on her own. Yes, she's not really um, sociable. She was just discussing with the chiropractor how she wishes that 
um, COVID life would never uh, re- revert to the old version. <laughs> She never wants to leave her house again. And she's got lots of viral reasons lined up for after COVID. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, that's that's good to know that Pomeranians are thriving with a large family. And the human is doing just fine pretty much on her own. Yes, she does not need backup. She's fine. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks a lot, Hedwig. You enjoy thanks, your Hedwig. evening with your siblings. I will. Thank you so much. And do enjoy your own evening. Thank you. Au revoir. And we're here with Karen Quinlan, my good friend and dog trainer extraordinaire, who I often turn to for um, advice on uh, all things dog training. Uh, She also has two stores, one in Naples, Florida, Crate and Marrow, and one in Charlottesville. So we in Virginia are very lucky that she's so... Oh, what did I say? Naples. I can't (laughs) afford Naples. We're in Venice. (laughs) Sorry. Venice, Florida, (laughs) and Charlottesville, Virginia. And I wanted Karen to come on today because there seems to be a rise in uh, canine separation anxiety. And... Much of this may be due to the pandemic puppies that are, Mm -hmm. you know, now a year old and we're getting there and uh, their humans are out and about doing things, going back to work. And these dogs are suffering severe anxiety. So I just knew the right person to contact to talk about this. And it's Karen. So, Karen, welcome to the Critters. Thank you, Tigger. I look forward to helping as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that's been so shocking to me, in, in and I, I've been following different groups, particularly Australian Shepherds on Facebook, the amount of medication that is being prescribed for dogs with separation anxiety. Mm. Yeah, I think this is becoming a chronic issue of, for not only separation anxiety, but pretty much anything that people perceive is wrong with the dog, the first go-to is medication. And for the most part, I am anti-medication unless it is so, so, so severe, then it's a possibility. But, you know, the problem with a lot of these medications is they um, kind of suppress And when you're dealing with an emotional issue in a dog, such as separation anxiety, which is fear, you know, know, all these emotions going through, you're just suppressing that. You're not changing the underlying emotion. And if we can't change the underlying emotion because our dog's brains are numb from these medications, nothing's going to change. Sometimes I've seen behaviors get worse because we don't know how these drugs really affect a dog's mind. Dogs were never, ever, 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 ever meant to be on drugs, in my humble opinion. Um, You know, you're talking about anxiety drugs, anxiety drugs. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, and they're kind of all one and the same. There's the Prozac. Sometimes they'll do that, which has been, you know, Prozac really, really messes with them. Sometimes they'll, and this is crazy because I had a client come in whose dog, uh, was put on Xanax, and I thought, oh, Lord, so we're going to try to work with this, but the vet told her the dog wouldn't get addicted, and I thought, oh, my God, this is the most addictive drug on the face of the planet, and the vet didn't think the dog would get addicted, so now we have to kind of, so there, there's always a fallout when you're using drugs, and again, if you're just trying to make the behavior stop through a drug, it will never completely stop and and has the potential to become much, much worse. So the destruction that people are reporting, um, you know, ripping up things and tearing at things while their humans are gone. And I, I read a lot that the solution for some of these dogs is to crate them Mm. where they still get anxious They just can't destroy everything. Sure. Well, and, and, you know, first we need to break down 
what type of destruction. Uh, Dr. Ian Dunbar, one of my favorites, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he's a Mm-mm. vet and a behaviorist. And what he used to call it, 90% of the time was what he would refer to as separation fun. So if your dog's merely chewing up pillows and shredding stuff, that's just, hey, I'm bored. This is a good way to entertain myself. The true severe separation anxiety is ripping at doors, windows, ripping screens, that kind of stuff. So first you have to determine what truly is going on here. Um, Because, you know, a particularly young dog thinks nothing of, of, you know, I had a dog tear apart a couch once. He wasn't stressed. I think he was just thought, well, this could be fun. (laughs) So, um, so, you know, you have to break it down. You have to really, truly understand what's going on. And, you know, if if you've been home for a year because of the pandemic and you could play with your dog and you could redirect them and entertain them, and now you're gone all day, the dog will find its own way to entertain himself. So break that down and find out what's really going on. Is this true separation anxiety or is it separation fun? So there's your first step. Okay. Um, crating can help, but if if any human being out there thinks that it is okay to crate their dog for eight hours a day when they're at work, you are just opening up a can of worms that you are not going to want to even. It's first, it's cruel, and it's it's just unacceptable. Um, second, it can too make things much worse. Some dogs are claustrophobic. And, I, you know, some dogs can hurt themselves more in a crate than not in a crate. So you have to know that. Does your dog even like this crate? You know, just throwing a dog who's never been crate trained into a crate is not a good idea. Yeah, no. So, you know, you have to break that down. You have to train that. You have to desensitize it. And, again, I don't believe any dog on the face of the planet should be crated for more than four hours at a time. Yeah. I just don't think it's fair. So... The the root of separation anxiety is fear. Um, fear. It can be fear. It can be loneliness. It can be, uh, you know, many, many things. And again, that's why, you know, this kind of drug thing is not the right thing. We have to figure out what is going on. Is my dog fearful? You know, why are they fearful? Did they, they come from a shelter and now all of a sudden, and, and just to get such fun crates again, I've always seen dogs that came out of shelters much worse in crates than dogs that have not come out of a shelter because it's that fear of confinement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for some dogs, it's just loneliness and, and I've, Hey, I've been here all day long. I, I, I don't know what to do with myself as my human coming back. And if they've never, ever been left alone, and this is why I think we're seeing this, this huge increase because unfortunately humans didn't understand, Hey, I need to leave my dog alone for short periods of time and build up to, because a dog needs to see that you leave, but you always come back. You leave, but you always come back. And if it's been a year and you're just gone for a day, that dog totally freaks out. That's their frame of reference right there. Every time my human leaves, I'm going to be alone for these nine hours and I can't take it. So what are the the first steps towards um, helping uh, your dog deal with their separation anxiety? Well, and again, this is layers that we have to peel away. And, you know, whenever I work with a dog, I, I look at the behavior, but I also look at what's impacting dogs. And, you know, this is the holistic approach. What are you feeding your dog? You know, food is so critical and it's actually being documented. Oh, yes, there is a, a clear you know, um, let's see what I'm looking for. Anyway, they can clearly tell now that there is such a relationship between gut and mental health. Mm -hmm. And if you're feeding the wrong foods, if you are uh, giving your dog toxic flea and tick medications, the internal or the external for that matter, but particularly now even feeding them, we're seeing so much more. So if you, if your dog doesn't have a healthy gut, then your likelihood of behaviors increases very much. Yeah. And again, there are many, many dogs, you know, this is the irony. If we don't understand each dog and what is affecting them. When I worked in the mental health field, it was called the biopsychosocial circle, so hmm. biological, psychological, and social. And we looked at that when we were looking at each human being, and we need to do that same thing for dogs. One, understanding the biology, what kind of dog are they? Two, what's going on? 
psychologically, had they been traumatized? Did we not desensitize them? Did we not do all this? And then third is their social. And because dogs are social creatures, all of a sudden being left home for nine hours a day is is just is too much for them. That being said, you might get a dog who you walk out for nine hours and they're sleeping on the couch till you come home. That dog probably is more balanced in other areas of his life. You know, the food, the training, the, the security age. Age has a lot to do with mm-hmm. it. Young dogs have all this energy. And like I said, hey, let's just tear apart the couch or chew <laughs> a table or, you know. I consider them I also have sort of like Berber civil carpet. engineers. They just want to yeah. figure out how stuff works. So they exactly. take apart your pillow. <laughs> yes. That's yes, this I had a of. dog unravel an entire Berber carpet when I came home, which I actually <laughs> found hilarious because I thought, oh, he must have had so much fun just unraveling it all. <laughs> you know, um, and that was that. You know, I just got a new rug. I did not get a Berber carpet. <laughs> so, you know, and, 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 you know, the other thing is, Uh, the humans, humans get very, very frantic. So, you know, they come home, they see something destroyed and they start screaming at the dog. Yeah. So now the dog's developing anxiety because they want their human to come home, but they get yelled at. They don't have, they don't realize, Oh yeah, that's right. I chewed that pillow three hours ago. All they understand is my human just came in and yelled at me. Now I have this stress of my human coming home. So there, there are just so many variables and, and I strongly encourage Anybody who's doing this, find a professional to work with. And you got to be careful of that, too. That's a whole yeah. other tangent. But yeah. with all due respect to vets, they are not your first go-to because vets suppress. You know, And, and, and I've said this a hundred times. If my dog breaks a leg, I'm going to the best vet out there to fix you it. Bet. But if I have other issues, I'm going to do this research myself or I'm going to find somebody knowledgeable in that area. Um, and, and, you know, they aren't, they don't understand separation anxiety, but Hey, let's give them this drug and see if that helps. (laughs) What are some of your tips for desensitizing a dog to help them be less fearful? Okay. So there, you know, there are a lot of things. And the first thing, and again, at some, you know, we may even be beyond this with some dogs and that's, but initially, and this is, can be daunting, but you've got to be able to put this work in. So, you know, all of us know, our dogs know which shoes we put on, what's going to happen. They know if we pick up our purse, they're probably not going. You know, they know these cues. So, you know, it starts with something as simple as, is, you know, giving your, maybe I like to throw a find it. So here, go find the treat. I pick up my keys, I go out the door. And when I'm first teaching this, I'm only gone for like five minutes and then I come back in. So you've got to set up a protocol where you can come in and and leave and come in and leave. Playing classical music is very, very calming for them. Some people put on Animal Planet. My dogs don't watch TV, but they like the music. Um, one of my very favorite things is um, a licky mat. Are you familiar with licky mats? I am. I love licky mats. And, and you know, they, they have one that's actually called the soother. So the only, you know, what I tell people, what's the behavior? The only time your dog gets licky mat is when you're gone. You know, if it's done correctly, you can't give bones and stuff like that because you've got to supervise them right. if they're chewing bones. But a licky mat, um, I like those, and, and I like to do like cream cheese or something that's really sticky and, and keeps them entertained for a while. And, you know, eventually, if done right, the dog's like, are you going to leave? I might like my licky mat. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, get out of here and give me my licky get mat. Get out of here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, these kinds of things, but it's that slow desensitization, you know. And, and again, because dogs are so aware, you know, if you pick up your keys, they immediately go into panic. So sometimes just pick up your keys and walk around the house because it's all about association for them. Uh-huh. You know, so, so certain things, um, you know, a, a very specific, and I often joke is when I leave my house, I look at my dogs and I say, be good. They don't even get off the couch. They know they're not going. They know. And, and, you know, if all else fails, get another dog. I always say that. Yeah. Because yeah. Then they'll have some company. Yeah. And if you cannot be home, then you either owe it to your dog to one, get them a, a mate, have a dog walker come in, yeah. three, 
have a pet sitter. You know, you can get pet sitters to come in for $10 an hour. And if they sit with your dog for two hours of that time, you've cut back on some of that. Get somebody really good who's going to come in and take that dog out for a nice long hike or something. But you can't just expect that you're going to leave that dog alone all day long and, and not have some issues. So, you know, it's setting rituals. The dogs really like rituals. You know, this this is the time I leave. This is the time I come back. I, for, personally, my dogs are all older except for the puppy. But if I'm gone them more than four hours, I have a pet sitter come over just for an hour, let him out to pee, tell him she loves him, give him a snack and leave. Um, you know, so those are the kind of things, just this, this expectation that I'm not going to be left alone for what seems like the rest of my life because I'm a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Do you um do you think that um socialization early on as a puppy has anything to do with the level of anxiety or is that unrelated? Um, you know, I, I think it's somewhat in unrelated and, and, and that's okay. what's going on this whole other thing because that's the other thing that unfortunately humans get wrong is socialization and and now i see so many other problems because oh i got to get my puppy out and everybody they see us and touch them and love on them and every dog they see they have to say hi to and now you get these dogs who are extremely reactive because they don't want to see people they don't want to see dogs and they just want to be left alone um so you know it, it's interesting so you know when we talk about socialization yes your dog should be socialized but that simply means exposure. It means taking your dog out for a walk, letting them see people, see other dogs, but not going up and playing with everybody they see. Um, you know, it, it, so it's, it's, you know, and I, and I got this, you know, I, you know, as a trainer, I got all the calls. Oh, my dog so misbehaved because we didn't get him socialized due to the pandemic. And I think to myself, well, no, your dog's misbehaved because you probably didn't do anything with it for nine months. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and now it's an adolescent. Yes. So, you know, the reality is for 90% of dogs out there, the only thing they really need is their human. You're their safety net. You are the one who will teach them they will be safe. And and unfortunately, we don't do that. We just don't understand um, you know, and, and and I often say this in my household, I have four dogs, but I'll tell you what. They don't care so much about each other, but if mom comes home, they're all vying for attention. Yeah. They want me because I kind of set the rules. I set the boundary. I give the treats. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, these kinds of things. But I also, you know, teach them, hey, I don't want to be jumped on and I, I don't want you playing living room agility, which I have a little yeah. bit of that going on right now with a puppy. Yes. Um, you know, I expect you to wait. So, and, and that's the other thing. When we're talking about calming the mind, if we are not doing simple exercises on a daily basis, that's calming the dog's mind, you know, whether it's puzzles or licking mats or playing the find it game where you hide treats yeah. everywhere and then let them go find them. Oh, it's There's so many things involved in rather than just say, oh, separation, anxiety, drugs. No, let's Let's look at this. Let's look at this. What are we feeding? You know, a lot of people don't understand that if you feed a, a nervous dog chicken, you've just made it 10 times worse because yes. that's a heating food yeah. and it's a nervous animal and it's inflammatory and, you know, all of these things. And, and again, is your dog destroying things and eating things because there's a gut imbalance? Maybe it has something to do with separation anxiety. Maybe they're trying to heal their gut, which is, you know, that eating of inanimate objects, um, Usually, so there's there's so many things, Tigger, that I could just go on and on and on and on with. Um, so you know, I I, am a- I have a um, I have a theory, and I, and I don't mm-hmm. think it applies across the board. Mm-hmm. And this is really limited to one litter of puppies that I had this spring, mm-hmm. and I did the puppy culture. Mm-hmm. And every single one of those puppies, and I've seen a couple of them fairly recently, like within the last week. And then Mm -hmm. I get reports on the others. Mm -hmm. While they may be, you know, Australian shepherds, they they are mischievous and they can get themselves into trouble. Mm -hmm. Um, But none of them suffer from anxiety. 
Oh. And I wonder if that isn't a part of how they were raised because I exposed them to hair dryers, mm-hmm. cooking noises, pots and mm-hmm. pans, vacuum cleaners. Mm-hmm. We did tunnels outside. I had, you know, play agility stuff, small mm-hmm. stuff. Took them on walks when they were six weeks old. They'd walk out of the gate with me and the big dogs. Mm-hmm. And we'd walk into the grass and we'd smell the flowers and we'd see the chickens. Mm -hmm. And so they're very confident. Yes. And that's the exposure that I was talking about. They were able to explore their world. They were with you. They were with the bigger dogs. So there was a safety net in that. They weren't put in scenarios that made them scared or not put in any scenario at all. You know, and that could be the, the, you know, the pandemic thing. People maybe took their dog out to feed them, rushed them back into the house. Yeah. So they didn't get that exposure. And, you know, that can be turned around. But again, this is when you need a professional because so oftentimes I see people, their dog is terrified of something. And they try to drag them through it. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And I'm like, stop, just stop and let the dog stand there. Yeah. Do not try to force anything. Let them see you're not going to die. This guy's not falling. You know, and I often, I think you've heard me say this, you know, it, um, when, <laughs> when a, when you have a litter of puppies and, and you, you've probably, you probably saw this Tigger and, and didn't even realize, it, or maybe you did, maybe you know, but when you've got a litter of puppies and something startles the puppies, the first thing they do is look at their mother. Yep. If the mother doesn't react, they learn, Hey, no big deal. If the mother reacts, they learn to fear it. So if you're the human out there, and and this is the dog's perception, scary, now the human goes into overdrive. Come on, let's go. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Like, And what they say, oh, God, mom's terrified of this too. But if you just stand there and hang out, nonchalant, eventually the dog's like, well, we're just going to sit here all day. We're going to (laughs) move. Because they saw that, again, nothing horrible happened. And so what you did was fantastic. You provided that exposure and they also had, you know, the, the huge benefit of some really balanced adult dogs. And I'll tell you what, no matter how good I am, I'm never going to be as good a teacher as an adult balanced dog. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's so true. And one, you know, I, I, one thing I really learned in the experience, I learned a lot, but w- one thing that really struck me was how mom disciplined the kids. And I went, mm-hmm. yeah, that's the thing, is that when when we get into the nagging mode, mamas don't mm-hmm. nag. They just say, uh, no, no biting. Right. End of conversation. <laughs> End of conversation. <laughs> yes. Well, and and you're so correct. And this is funny because I, you know, now that I'm in Florida, I have older people in my class and I was in class one day and, you know, everything the husband, because now we get the husbands and the wife who've lived together for 40 years and and really don't like each other. And (laughs) so everything the husband did, four of the wives are going, no, you didn't do that right. And try this, try this. Finally, I said, okay, everybody needs to stop. And I said to the husbands, I said, how are you feeling right now with all this nagging going on? And they all laughed. And I said, how do you think your dog feels? Yep. Okay. Because at least you can understand what your wife is saying. And the wives realized, yeah, we're kind of nagging. I said, now put yourself in your dog's position who doesn't even know what you want. They just hear blah, 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 blah. And all this pressure put on them and, and the screaming and people scream, people scream at dogs. And it's, it's, it never does anything. The only time you ever scream at a dog is if they're in severe danger. And then they might listen. Otherwise, you know, so you're so right. This, you know, think of how, and the mother teaches too. She She's teaching things. And then if the dog steps over, the, the puppy steps out of the boundary. She's like, all right, that's enough of that. Yeah. Boom. And, and the puppy goes, okay, mom's badass. Uh, and it, yes. <laughs> you and, know? It's quick. and it's <laughs> and like it is, to the point, And then we mm-hmm. move on. Yes. And then she loves, and that's the other thing. Humans bear grudges. Yes. You know, I, it, I see it all the time. Okay. So you corrected your dog. Now your dog's being appeasing and cute and you're still pissed at your dog. This is not okay. You know, move on, love them again. The second they change their behavior, look at you, look at you being such a good dog. So, you know, it all, again, when we just talk, if we just touch upon separation anxiety, we're doing an injustice to that dog. 
we have to look at everything. And, you know, I've always said my book's going to be before you accuse me, take a look at yourself. You know? <laughs> um, you know? <laughs> so true. Yeah, it is so true. It is so true. Um, you know, dogs do mimic us. They mimic our behavior, our energy. Um and conversely, humans go get dogs with their nervous energy, and then they resent that dog. Yes. You know, we are drawn to dogs with similar personalities. We don't know it, but we are. That's why I always get the nice lazy dogs. <laughs> I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't make the same claim. I don't tend no, to. No, but look to at you. You dog. are this wonderful be- bundle of energy, and your energy is perfect for your dogs because you love them and you appreciate their energy. So you're being a part of it. You're not blaming or, you know, and that's a problem. And people oftentimes get the wrong dog. Yeah. Okay. And Aussies are smart and they like to do things, but they also have to be taught how to not do anything. They absolutely do. And then, (laughs) and they're happy to learn that because um, they like to chill out. They're mm-hmm. good at chilling out. Yes. Yes. But what makes them so, what I love about them is that when you, you, you get up and, you, and you're ready to do something, they are like blasted out of a rock. And they're like, okay, let's go. <laughs> They've just been sound asleep <laughs> for two hours. Yes. And <laughs> other dogs might be, uh, I got to get up and I need a drink of water. And okay, <laughs> let's, let's go. But they're but, like rocket ships. They're like, okay, yeah. it's time to go. Let's go. It's, yeah. uh, it's and, amazing and, 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 to me they can go from zero to 60 that quickly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but you've also done the good job of showing zero to 60, now shut it back down to zero. Yeah. Oh, it's um, a and, and it, 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 it absolutely is. And a lot of people don't understand that. It's like, I get to exhaust this dog. This dog's hyper. It's making me crazy. So I'm going to throw a ball for three hours. Oh. Okay, well, that yeah, no. created a prey-driven neurotic nut, yeah. you know? <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, you don't want them that fit. No. That's, that's the thing. And, no, you and, don't. Have you ever done barn hunt? We're going to get into that um, later in in our podcast today, but do you know much about barn hunt? Just um, I've done... Son, I didn't do it with the rats, but we did um, like sheep skin or sheep wool and that kind of stuff to start. I, I was I, I just freaked out a little bit about the rats, so I maybe didn't attend those sessions. But um, I love it and and scent work. Oh, I can't think of. Well, you are great scent. with scent work. You taught me <laughs> so much about scent work, and I did it with the puppies. Yes. Yes. And there's your calming of your mind right there. Yep. You're calming the mind. You are working the mind. And, and I'll tell you what, if you want your dog to be tired, you do a combination of both. And it takes half the time and they're twice as tired. Yes. For you sure. got to work that mind. It's not that mindless, like we said, chasing, but, you know, and, and you, you know, my dog Pokey, and, and he's yes. one who would, he would have just killed himself fetching a ball. So I knew, you know, this is not good. Um, he was obsessed. So what I started doing with him, and, and I recommend this for anybody, if, if your dog really loves the ball, you throw it twice, then you put him in a downstay. And I when in Virginia, all the woods, I would put him in a downstay. I'd go hide that ball and I'd come back and I'd say, okay, find it. And he would go on this marvelous hunt. You would see his tail just twirling. He wasn't racing because he had to sniff. Right. And, you know, and he would find that ball and he, it became, he loved that just as much. And there was the quieting and working of the mind. Um, so those kinds of things, you know, put a few treats in some boxes and line them up and let them go yep. find which box the treats in. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to be a champion show person. You just have to be willing to set up some things that can challenge your dog's mind. Um, and the find it game is one of the easiest ways to do that. Oh yeah, it's I use it all the time. Are you kidding me? Too. 
<laughs> yep. I mean, one of my favorites is when I've had enough and I take a handful of treats and I throw them out in the yard. I say, go find it. And yep. I shut the door. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I haven't it tried that. <laughs> oh, you've got to because they're foraging and it, this creates the foraging and the scavenging, which is so such a primal instinct in all of them because they still share 98% of DNA of the wolf. Yeah. Um, so this is, you are just providing this in a domesticated manner. Here, I'm going to throw some treats out in the yard. Go forage. They love it. (laughs) Well, so if you, uh, if our listeners out there are needing some advice from Karen, she does Zoom calls, um, help with behavior training, um, teaching some scent games, wanting to deal with anxiety and kind of focus on what the real issue is. She has a website. It's pausabilitiesdogtraining.com and uh, it's in our show notes. So be sure to contact her. And Karen, thank you so much. I always love talking to you. I always learn something. And I always learn things from you as well. I mean, it's such a wonderfully mutual, beneficial relationship. Yes, it is. So thanks, Karen. And I'm going to play Patty again. Here we are at the <laughs> Breed of the Show portion of our podcast. But as Tigger alluded to earlier, we are not doing Breed of Show this time. We are doing Sport of Show. Da, da, da. And uh, this this little dive into the sport of barn hunt was inspired by a friend of mine named Sandy and her greyhound, Ben Ben. Because Ben Ben is an amazing rat dog. Wow. And she was doing some barn hunt with him. And I suspect he excelled. He has very high prey drive. And this is what barn hunt is. It's, it's kind of like what you would think with a name like barn hunt. It was inspired and invented by a gal by the name of Robin Nuttall. And I'm sorry, Robin, if I've pronounced that wrong. She had a little min pin named Zipper. And Zipper needed something to do. And Minpin, I guess, are good rat dogs. So she invented something called Barn Hunt. And it is based on the traditional roles of your vermin-removing dogs, the little terriers that we're all familiar with. And the idea is it should test the horse's speed, agility. Not the horse. The dog. The dog. Did I say horse? (laughs) shame on me (laughs) wow barn hunt for horses that could get interesting Um, i was thinking the same thing yeah um sure-footedness um and the responsiveness to handler direction which i thought was interesting i didn't Mm. realize that how the dog responded you just let them loose i did too but apparently not um the handler um guides the dog a little bit when i was watching video you know how in agility, the handler will use his mm-hmm. eye line and his hand to help guide the dog? It looked a lot like that. And what the arena or corral or whatever that they're working in is basically a small round pen looking thing full of random bales of straw. Some of them are broken. Some of them are stacked. It's just imagine a really, really messy hayloft. That's what it looks like. So they go in there and do that. There's no do- there is no collar or leash on the dog. He must work independent in that regard. And the dog is to find a rat in this hayloft. And the rat is safely contained inside of a special rat tube <laughs> so that the dog can't actually catch the rat. But the dog has to signal to the handler that he has found the rat. And the funny part is, depending on the level of competition, there are a number of tubes that smell like rat, but there's no rat inside. Uh, And yeah, the handler has to be able to tell the difference when he sees his dog because the tubes are hidden, are to be hidden in such a way so that when the dog finds the tube, the handler can't see the tube. He can only see the dog. So by watching his dog, his or her dog, 
the handler needs to be able to say, oh, he's found a tube, but that tube doesn't actually have a rat in it. And the handler will call the dog off and ask him to continue to hunt. Or he will observe the dog and he will say, oh, there's a rat in that one, at which time the handler says to the judge, there's a rat in there. And then they get, the, they get, point, they get a score accordingly. If they guess wrong, their score isn't as good, which I thought was really kind of cool. That's really cool. Um, Do they change where the rat is for every different dog? The location of, if I remember right, I was reading a lot of it. If I remember right, the tubes stay in the same places, but which tubes have rats is different. Changes. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's open to all dogs of all breeds. Uh, it's an independent organization. The Hunt Barn Hunt Association is independent, but it is recognized by the AKC and the UKC mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of others. So you can gain points for your AKC. So how do you dogs. train for it? I suspect any the same way you do any scent work in that you teach the dog because he wants to follow a scent. That that's where a good you, thing to follow that scent. Where do you teach scent. him about the rat scent? Um, you get a rat. <laughs> They have they ha and they have Two baby rats. beginner they have baby beginner level which is called instinct and it's timed whoever does it successfully fast enough and the baby the baby level instinct only lasts a minute there are three tubes and one rat so there's two tubes that don't have rats and the ta the tubes are actually on top of things they're not hidden or buried uh, uh. Uh, so you your dog has to know what scent is favored right and your dog has to know leave it or okay good job now let's move yeah. on so basic um life skills i guess is where you would start there they've had um tripod dogs can do it because they don't have to run they can deaf dogs can do it blind dogs can do it all they have to have is a nose so that was kind of cool that's really cool. And they compete by the size of dog. The 18-inch wide tunnel that they create with hay bales, because as you move up the levels, they have to go through a tunnel. Um, as long as your dog is small enough to fit through an 18-inch tunnel, it's fine. But when they actually compete, they compete by size, small, medium, and large dogs. 18 inches is pretty small. That's pretty small. Can you imagine a greyhound getting in? Well, you know, greyhounds are, are, are very They're narrow. They're all yeah. legs. They're all legs. Um, at the highest level called Master Barn Hunt, they have four and a half minutes to, to finish what they can finish. There are up to eight different tubes on the course. Wow. Up to five of them have rats. The tubes can be hidden anywhere, on top of, underneath, through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there must be a tunnel aspect to the course. And the tunnel can be up to 25 feet long. Wow. Yeah. So I, obviously they have to have breaks in the tunnel where the handler can see yeah. the dog. But that was kind of cool. Um, and they have something at the end of the year called the Ratty Award. Because <laughs> they award that to the handler who has positively impacted the sport, which I thought was kind of fun. So that, that's what Barn Hunt is. I want to try Barn Hunt, but I don't have a dog right now. I want to try barn hunt too. Yes, I think I think that at least one of your Aussies should oh, try barn hunt. Absolutely. A couple of them are very good centers. Yeah. The when I watched I watched a little video before we got started this evening, and the first dog they showed on a video was a Italian greyhound. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, and it was seriously, seriously wound up. <laughs> I bet. As, as if a, a, an Italian greyhound needs an excuse to get wound up, but it was pretty cool. And now we're at Tigapedia. And I want to answer a question that I get asked often, which is um, when a horse is diagnosed with hindgut ulcers and put on on medication for hindgut ulcers, do I need to, to do a diet change? 
And my answer is yes. You kind of want to think of giving the hind gut a rest. And what that means is changing from giving flakes of hay because they're stemmy, they've got a lot of lignin in them. Um, they can be a little harder to digest and substitute with chopped hay, chaff hay, um, soaked hay cubes. It doesn't mean eliminating hay, hay flakes entirely, but if your horse, say, gets six flakes of hay a day, you might want to reduce it to two or three and substitute with triple crown has a very nice safe starch um i love chaff hay which is a fermented alfalfa um but it just gives the hind gut a rest they can have as much pasture as they want you you don't really have to change um the grain but getting uh reducing the amount of stemmy hay um in a 30-day period can make an enormous difference just in a couple of days. Um, and the other thing that I really like to help with the inflammation of hindgut ulcers is hemp seed oil, not hemp oil, hemp seed oil. Hemp seed oil contains gamma linoleic acid, known as GLA. And GLA is used by the body to regulate the prostaglandins. These are hormone-like substances that are responsible in both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory responses. Misoprostol, which is a very common medication used for hindgut ulcers, uh, is a synthetic prostaglandin. So the wonderful thing about hemp is that we can provide the GLA and it will help regulate the pro-inflammatory prostaglandins that affect the hindgut. So that is the a long answer to the short question. Um, yes, change the diet, but you really only have to do it for 30 days. Feed the chopped hay in ground feeders or soaked hay cubes in ground feeders. Um, and you will find that your horse actually feels better in a couple of days. Cut. How interesting. Now, yeah. a lot of folks, you hear, oh, my horse has ulcered. Has you had him diagnosed? Yes, no, et cetera. So right. this is something that you're going to do in conjunction with your veterinarian's diagnosis Abs that your horse has fine gut ulcers. 100%. Yeah. You first have to get the diagnosis. Yeah. Now, where does grass fall in this spectrum? Oh, no, grass is great. You know, because it's not, doesn't have significant lignin in it. It's, it the, it's the leafy part because they're eating the grass, not the Ex big long stem. Got it. Exactly. Got it. So, horses diagnosed, horses on medication. We want to change. What kind of, what does that look like? My horse normally gets three flakes of alfalfa the broom, broom grass morning and evening and then late night he gets another extra flake so he's getting seven flakes a day of alfalfa broom grass mix we're starting our medication he's going to be on this medication for the next 30 days how does what does that actually look like when i start to make that change away from stemmy baled hay so you're going to be Filling that ground feeder very generously, and you're probably going to do it depending on the turnout time. If there's no turnout time, the horse is in the stall the entire 24 hours or 23 hours when he's not being the one hour he's being ridden. Then you would want to give it with breakfast, then you'd want to give it at noon, then you'd want to give it in the afternoon, then you'd want to give it at dinner, and then I, you know, maybe you want to give a flake at least two flakes, maybe three flakes um, at night check because you've got to get him through that 10 hours till breakfast. Right, right. Does 
soaking regular long stemmed hay have any effect on no. those lignans? It does not. So no. it, it makes it squishier and softer to our hands, but from the digestive point of view, it no, doesn't. No, it's make still difference. got a ton of lignin. You have to chop it. Got it. Interesting. Didn't know those things. Well, you always learn something with Tigopedia. <laughs> So in Coffee Clatch today, um, we thought it would be fun to hear about troubles with Jennifer and Glenn on their 33-day road trip. And Jennifer is going to share with us um, some memorable moments of On the Road Again. (laughs) I feel like I should put a little musical bumper in there. (laughs) Absolutely. Yes, we did. This has been one of Glenn's, this has been on Glenn's to-do list for years. And we finally made it happen. It was supposed to be a 35-day trip. It got knocked, knocked down a little bit to 33 days. But we we survived it. Our horses survived it. And our listeners survived it. <laughs> And what we did is we packed ourselves up in our pickup truck in our little 24-foot long travel trailer camper. And we headed up through the middle of the country. With uh, We went from Florida to Alabama to Tennessee to Michigan, to Ohio, Ohio again, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, and then Florida again, I think is how it went. And we just stopped at various and sundry listeners' farms. We were invited. Thank you very much. We didn't just stop in and spend a night or two at each one. And we'd have little get-togethers and meet listeners. And and lots of folks had lots of lovely things to say about Health of Critters Radio. Aww. Because we asked everybody what what shows they listened to. And, of course, Health of Critters was in there. And uh, Tigopedia and Critter Nutrition, they love your factoids. Everybody loves your factoids. So there you go. Great. Like the one we just did, for example. (laughs) And Hedwig, as you might have guessed, is polarizing. Yes. Either love Hedwig or you hate her. So there you go. And I think Hedwig would be happy about that. Yeah, I think she'd be very pleased. Yes. So that's what the road trip was. Um, spoiler alert, there's liable to be another one in the future, but we got through the whole thing. The, we discovered that GPSs have a very, a, a, a main, a mean sense of humor. One in particular, we were driving to, was it Lindsay's house? We were driving to house, one of our listener meetups we got off I-95, and the play, our destination is less than five miles off the interstate. Okay. This is going to be easy. Pop it into the GPS. Driving along. Make a right on this street. Making a right on the street. Sign looming ahead. No trucks. Low underpass. Ten feet height. This is a problem. We're ten feet oh, six. shoot. <laughs> And it's oh, it's your geez. classic narrow back road, <laughs> minor panic. Apparently, oh, there are three different no. ways to get to our destination. The GPS had to pick the one with the 10-foot underpass. Oh, so what did you do? <laughs> Luckily for us, as soon as the sign came into view, uh, before we got any further, we saw a, an, an abandoned warehouse that we went in and turned around. And from the looks of it, a lot of people were turning around at that abandoned warehouse. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so if it weren't for that, it would have been a long afternoon. Wow. So, so that, that was kind of interesting. That was actually the only one of those we came across. We were really expecting to have a lot of spots where we couldn't go through, but we were pay- paying very, very close attention to the underpass signs. Because we didn't want to take our air conditioner off the top. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, what else? Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this urban legend about waffle houses. If you want to, exp- if you want to experience a breakfast time fist fight, you go to a waffle house. Really? Yeah, that's a thing. I've eaten at a lot of waffle houses over uh, time. There you go. 
But I never eat breakfast there, only dinner. See, that's the trick. It has to be breakfast time, Waffle House. Ah, boy, I've missed this all this. Look at what's missing from my life. See, these things you need to do. Well, we got got to experience the Waffle House effect (laughs) on our trip early on. We we pulled we pulled into a fuel station, and it was a very very busy fuel station. Every pump had at least two cars. Oh boy! It had a very odd setup with access roads, and it was right up against a four lane surface road. It was kind of a mess. And as we pulled in to fill up our diesel, we don't have a lot of choice which pump we use because we're the diesel. No. Glenn's just standing there holding the trigger open there, and it's going and it's going and it's going. And I'm watching a U-Haul truck with a car being towed. Oh, those are tricky. Out. It just pulled off the access road. It's sitting in line, waiting patiently. And the poor woman, you, you can imagine, you're, you're hauling your life and your car in a U-Haul. You're stressed. Yeah. Guaranteed. Yes. Big time. Big time. And she's just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. She's waiting for a good 10 minutes because the place is full. And as she's waiting there, she's... Her, the car she's towing is still on the access road. Oh, boy. And the U-Haul is in the entrance part, the little driveway part. And she's still got the car in the access road because if oh, she pulls God. in the whole way off the road, then cars can't get through to exit the pumps. Uh... She's being very smart and not causing gridlock. <sighs> smart girl. And I look over and this little teeny tiny pickup truck zips right in front of her. And pulls into the pump where she's facing. And he gets out and he starts reading this lady the bride act because she didn't move. And that's why he took her place. And the yelling commences. Did she yell back? She just sat quietly in her U-Haul. I felt terrible for her. But everybody else started yelling. That was the scary part. At him? At him. And then he would yell back at them. And then somebody else would yell from across the parking lot. It's like, oh my God. Glenn's just keeping his head down because they're trying to get us to start yelling too. People are yelling at us. Well, what do you think? Like, no, we don't think anything. We don't know any of these people. (laughs) I see nothing. I see nothing. I see nothing. So we got to experience the Waffle House effect. That was kind of fun. Wow. Yeah. And I didn't think about it. And then as this whole thing dissipated and we, we get to leave as I'm leaving gridlock because people are trying to get in. I literally can't leave. My trailer is now in the area where people need to drive through to leave the pumps because I'm trying to leave and somebody coming in refuses to move because they want to get to a pump that's being covered up by somebody else. So we sit there for four or five minutes and I finally inch my way out. Things start to move again and way off six or eight car lengths down the access road that I need to take to get to the interstate again. There's some guy sitting in there in this old beater of a car. It was like 1989 K car or something. (laughs) Just nasty looking. And he's just sitting there. He's just sitting still. He has it in park. He doesn't even have any gear. Just laughing. At the gridlock at the gas station. <laughs> Just laughing. Yeah. That was good. You know, I learned with hauling horse trailers that um, I, when I was going to get gas, it was going to be at a truck stop. We try, had, yeah, we try to use a, a pilot or a loves or something like that when we can because they're just larger. Yep. <laughs> makes such a difference. Yeah. That's one of the stresses when traveling like we were for 33 days. All, well, I shouldn't say that. Of the 33 days, 28 of them were in unfamiliar territory. <laughs> yeah, that's stressful, not knowing where you're going and we had this plan, but like. And yeah. Yeah, and we tried to stay off the interstates. Part of the adventure was seeing more of America and less of the interstate. So we didn't always have that option. Sometimes it's like, no, we're going to have to use that little gas station because that's what we've got. <laughs> yep. Yep. But sometimes in rural areas, that's actually easier. Yeah. It's- and we had to be, yeah. And we tried, we tried to use gas stations that 
were frequented, so we had less less chance of the credit card numbers being stolen. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. There's that. So that that was our our Waffle House effect. It was funny that we had at least one of those. So that happened. And I got to ride some really fun, fun horses at several stops. So that was nice. Oh, Kept cool. me sane. Because by the time I came home in 33 days, I really just wanted to come home and ride my horse. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that was fun. I got to, and I got to try mounted archery. I've never done that before. I can't even imagine. It was fun. I, I want to go get myself a little Nerf bow and try it. <laughs> it was fun. Have you ever tried polo? I have. Have you ever played stick and ball, which is basically just yes. volleying? I found p- doing the stick and ball part, which is just going along and gently tapping the ball, just the practicing ball. your swing, so to speak. Yep. I found that mesmerizing. I could do that all afternoon. And when I did mounted archery, I only did it at a walk. I didn't try to trot and shoot a bow at the same time. <laughs> that would be folly. Same thing, though. It was almost mesmerizing to walk along. And I found myself counting strides. <laughs> You're probably not supposed to. Two, three, two, one, shoot. It was just mesmerizing. So if you ever have the opportunity, give it a go. Um, I Yeah, I, I just don't see me in archery. I did archery as a kid, and I was actually quite good at it. But I, I, I just don't see myself doing it. <laughs> doing archery on on a horse now, maybe at, at a standstill, not even at a walk, at a halt. That, that might work. <laughs> well, to, in um, full disclosure, I was being led. <laughs> ah, now that might work. <laughs> this was this was an extremely experienced mounted archery horse who does a lot of mounted archery les- lessons with clueless mount- mounted archery students like me. <laughs> That would be kind of cool. It was really neat. And the horse is very experienced. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew the deal. So he just would walk along in a straight line. And if he felt me getting my balance a little bit off, he'd stop. You know, he just, he knew the whole deal of it. And it was really, it was really fun because there was no pressure. There was no adrenaline. Just walking along, hitting the target, walking along, hitting the target. And then when we were all finished, Lindsay hopped up on the horse and went galloping around and, you know, looked like a Mongol. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So that was kind of fun. <clears throat> and so the, what, when's the next trip? <sighs> we don't know yet, but Glenn is already in his little brain working on plans for the next one. The goal in the long term when we started this big adventure was to do the East Coast, the middle of the country, and the West Coast. Because, you know, you have to divide it into thirds, I suppose. Yeah. Um, how that will pan out going forward, not exactly sure. Maybe we'll end up doing the south and then the north, you know, go along through Texas mm-hmm. and, you know, New Mexico like that. And then do a separate one through Seattle and Colorado and like Boy, that. That's, that's a huge trip. Yeah, who knows? And that's the, the hard Coast. part is getting getting there because everything yep. is so spread out. Uh, that uh, and one of the things that we wanted to do when we started this whole thing out is to use a horse trailer, a living quarters horse trailer, instead of a camper. The problem being that a living quarters horse trailer is pretty big and it won't fit in our driveway. Ah. So we're we're going to see if we can't make that happen somehow. We're going to have a friend who has a larger gooseneck come over and see how it goes pulling into our driveway and see how big a trailer we can so fit in comfortably. Can t- so you can take your horses? I still don't want to take the horses partly because... So why do you need a horse trailer? Because then we have a living quarters horse trailer so that when we want to go camping with our horses, we can't. Uh, <laughs> we would occasionally like to go camping with the horses. And also when we're not camping with the horses, it would be dual purpose. You just use the living quarters instead of a... We wouldn't have the travel trailer anymore. We just have that. Gotcha. Because when the horses aren't in it, that those stalls can just become one giant recording studio. True. True. Uh, so that that's something that you, it's it's in it's on the dry erase board right now. So who knows? So if, if you're someone <laughs> listening who owns a horse trailer manufacturing company and you would like to talk to us about <laughs> how you could sponsor Horse Radio Network Roadshow 2.0. 
Just give us a call, Jennifer at horseradionetwork.com. Just saying. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks to our sponsor, Biostar US. You can find them online at biostarus.com. Get the Horse Radio Network phone app on iOS or Android by searching for Horse Radio Network in the App Store. It's free and easy to use. For details about today's show, go to healthycrittersradio.com, where you can find links, photos, and more information about our guests. As always, we love your feedback. Please follow us on Facebook under Healthy Critters Radio. Be sure to visit all the great shows on Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. 